You're listening to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, John Wood Jr. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Braver Angels podcast. And I'm extremely excited to speak to an individual who, uh, to my mind, uh, heralds something of a dawning paradigm shift in the American political landscape. I don't want to take a step back a moment to, to preface that comment by saying that while uh, Stephen Olacara is indeed a candidate for United States Senate, uh, he's not appearing on the Braver Angels podcast uh, merely or even chiefly uh, in his capacity as a political candidate, although we're going to talk about the race and I encourage people to look into what Stephen is doing on the campaign trail. But Stephen is a serious innovator in the depolarization movement, in the bridge building movement, and somebody who's really been able to bring that ethos to a, well, to a demographic uh, group in American society and to mainstream politics in a way that sets him apart as a leader in the space and somebody who, as a peer and, and, and a colleague, I greatly admire. So without further ado, uh, Stephen Olacara, welcome very much, my friend, to the Brave Rangers podcast. How are you, sir? Thank you, John. Doing well. It's an honor to be here. And, you know, you are fighting the good fight. And we were talking earlier about how you were ahead of your time when you ran for office. And uh, let's hope that the times have, have truly caught up to us here in, in this moment. <laughs> well, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can definitely hope that we're working to make it so. Uh, look, man, I want to talk to you about all sorts of things. I definitely want to talk about the campaign. You were out there stumping for United States Senator uh, to be the next United States Senator uh, from the great state of Wisconsin. We want to hear about that. But I want people to get sort of the Stephen Olacara story and whatnot. And, you know, one thinks about the best way to kind of lean into the origin story. And so I was thinking about this question uh, in the context of some of the things that we have in common. And you know what, man, it occurred to me that as I was, uh, you know, sort of reviewing some of your stuff, you and I have a lot in common. But one thing jumps out at me uh, above above all. It's not the fact that, you know, I once ran for office and you are running for office currently. It's not the fact that we each work in the depolarization space, myself with Braver Angels, yourself as founder of the Millennial Action Project, which we definitely want to talk about. Uh, it's, it's not even the fact that you and I are both students of Kingian nonviolence, uh, but it's the fact that you and I are both jazz musicians That's and right. musicians who take a lot of inspiration from, from many genres, but that each of us are deeply informed in our public sort of democratic mission by our relationship to jazz. And so why don't we start here with Stephen Olacara as artist, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. and maybe we can sort of zoom out from that to get a wider view over who you are and, and how you've come to the mission uh, that you embody. So take it away. Yeah. Well, jazz is the DNA of the kind of politics that I believe in. Jazz in many ways reordered my mind when I first started uh, playing the genre of music. It's one of the best ways to get to know me. So you're very wise to, to start <laughs> here. <laughs> you know, I first picked up the guitar when I was in third grade and the drums when I was in fourth grade. And my parents were immigrants from India. So, you know, really the preferred career track growing up was <clears throat> any form of engineering, whether it was mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, but music was really the vehicle for expanding my boundaries. Music exposed me to so many different subcultures within Milwaukee. And in the context of the greater Milwaukee area, which is a highly racially and ethnically and, and politically segregated metro area, right. music was that rare force to bridge and transcend uh, those divides. And when my bands with each one a motley crew of, of musicians from across those divides came together, I found that the art, the music we created was more original, more dynamic. It was just better. And to me, I felt like that's a metaphor for our democracy. And when I would see what was going on politically, the worsening polarization, the tribalism, it struck me that jazz has the key ingredients to, to fix those problems. And 
And it really started with the kind of spaces that I found in jazz music. Some of the most open, empathetic, dignified spaces that I've been in. And I think that was the key. You know, you speak a lot about how, <clears throat> you know, when you have differences coming together, uh, it really matters how those differences are coming together. Right. What are the kind of spaces? And with jazz, it's all about collaboration. And I, I usually point to three jazz modes. It's about improvisation, which is really an evolution of thought. It's being fully present. Um, it's call and response, which is having real conversations with people. And it's also about listening. And I think listening is such one of the most profound you know, attributes, uh, not only in jazz, but also uh, in a successful democracy. All of us need to, I think, have that jazz spirit, whether or not we play jazz music. Mm -hmm. We need to have that jazz spirit. And, um, and, and when we talk about political bridge building and depolarization, I think jazz is the perfect metaphor because we're not asking people, uh, and I'm not sure, I don't think you are either, we're not asking people to meet at the 50 yard line. You know, when you think about Dr. King's ideas for civil rights, those are radical, non-mainstream ideas. What jazz is saying is, no, no, no. Through listening and improvisation and the freedom to express yourself fully and this practice of empathizing with each other, that's going to move us to a new playing field. So it's not the 50-yard line, it's an evolution. And that's the difference here. And that's why I think jazz is so much a part of my DNA, how my mind thinks, uh, but also, I think, a great metaphor for democracy. Absolutely, brother. Yeah, when you come together in the jet, on the bandstand, you become greater than the sum of your parts. And, and that really expresses itself in the, you know, the sort of flourishing creativity explosion of expressiveness that that comes through in all manner of, of jazz. So, you know, I was raised by a, a jazz pianist, John Wood Sr., who recorded with folks like Joe Henderson and Woody Shaw, the tenor player, trumpet player, Billy Higgins, the most recorded drummer in, in jazz history and so forth. And the picture you paint was the picture that I was raised with. And, you know, my dad, even when I was a kid in the, you know, 90s and whatnot, you know, lamented the sort of the divisions, the balkanization of American society, not just in politics, but in culture and so on and so forth, you know. And, you know, my dad is a, is a white man, comes from Tennessee, politically leans strongly to, to, the, to the right, especially, especially these days. But, you know, his heroes in life growing up were folks like, you know, Muhammad Ali and Willie Mays. Baseball, boxing were his other passions. But then jazz uh, was his was his chief, his chief love. And he uh, he uh, patterned himself in many ways after Bill Evans, the white jazz pianist who played with John Coltrane and Miles Davis and many of those greats. Grew up looking up to Artie Shaw, Art Blakey and the jazz messengers and so forth. And so my vision of America that my father sort of passed down to me was in America where we were all meeting on the bandstand, right? So you had Bill, you had you had Miles, you had you had Train, you had you had all of these folks. You had Lee Morgan, you had Freddie Hubbard, um, you had people coming together. You know, uh, many African, predominantly African Americans, but people from all from all walks of life. Stan Getz, you know, major fan of Stan Getz, uh, and um, it it showed that there was something transcendent in our culture, something that allowed us to pull the differences of our experiences into a common creation. And what I would learn later on is that there's actually, you know, sort of a, a philosophical mode of understanding the American democratic project that anchors itself in that understanding. Uh, you know, shout out to a friend of mine. I don't know if you know him, but a man named Greg Thomas, who leads an organization called the Jazz Leadership Project, which is dedicating to, to sort of reviving the work of Albert Murray, this idea of the, the omni-American, you know, a sense of American identity in which me being an African-American, you're being an Indian-American, me being from Los Angeles, you being from Wisconsin, allows us to take a piece of each of our identities and sort of express them, you know, in this omni Americanness, where I am a product of you, you're a product of me, and it comes forth in the uniquely American culture that we produce, of which you know jazz is is as is quintessential sort of a product, as as any. So, um, quick question for you then: if if this is kind of a, a viable way of looking at American culture, do you see that being at risk today? Do you see us as sort of being in a moment to where we may be ceasing to appreciate the ways in which our differences actually sort of add up 
to something greater than the sum of their parts because we're taking a zero sum perspective on politics. Wow, yeah. Well, when you think about John Coltrane's A Love Supreme and this idea of a universal love and energy that, that binds us all together, it's a spiritual notion and, and you were speaking to that. I'm seeing that spiritual idea very much at risk right now. When you think about our democracy is not just a set of political institutions, it's a heart and a soul. And what is happening to that soul in America? And I think that when you have, you know, the data on polarization just as well as I do, with, you know, and, and the degrees to which Americans now see people of the other political party being not just different, but evil. When you have all of these trends that are really hardening people's viewpoints, not only ideologically, but about how other Americans think, then it does lead to a shrinking of imagination. It leads to a restrictive uh, view um, of, of what humanity can do and what democracy can do. It leads to a scarcity kind of mindset. And I think that um, I think we see that expressed in so many ways, like in Congress right now, a lot of what happens is really they're just governing from crisis to, cri to crisis. They're not thinking longer term. Here's what we can achieve together to solve a major problem. It's just how do we get through tomorrow? How do we get through the next election? And so I think one of the core realizations I had when I was entering into the depolarization space is that polarization leads to short-termism. Mm. It leads to a short-term view of, of issues. And I think that if you have that kind of spiritual awakening that John Coltrane and others were, were trying, I think, preaching about through their music, um, it would lead to not only more collaborative atmosphere, but also a way to think more creatively, imaginatively, and more long-term about where we're going um, as, as a society. Um, and, you know, when I think, I think that in the same way that jazz was ahead of its time, you know, in the 1950s, you mentioned Bill Evans, you know, Miles Davis and Bill Evans, black musician, white musician, completely different backgrounds coming together to create Kind of Blue, mm -hmm. the best-selling jazz record of all time. And, what other jazz musicians did like Coltrane, it really was ahead of their time. And I think that today we need that kind of creative redemption and renewal mm -hmm. through probably a combination of not only people in the discipline of politics, but also people in the creative fields as well. And there needs to be probably a happy marriage across these different fields for there to truly be that spiritual awakening around, um, you know, some people don't want to talk about it, but it is the concept of love, radical love, agape love, of, as Dr. King talked about. Um, you know, there, there needs to be that kind of spiritual awakening. And I think that uh, jazz is perhaps a vehicle for finding the right uh, notes uh, for that awakening. Yeah, I think that you're right. I think that enduring political change has to also be a product of enduring and deeper cultural change. And definitely in the case of the depolarization movement, which requires us, if we're going to have a democracy that functions in stable fashion on an institutional level, for us to be in deeper relationship with one another as Americans, so we can trust each other again to, to be able to share power in a way that actually, that actually works, right? And um, you know, therefore, the, the movement has to be about more than more than politics. But I do want to pull on the political thread a bit longer here to be able to talk a bit about your work with the Millennial Action Project, because one thing that some people will say, of course, is that, well, look, you know, trying to bring people together across uh, party lines that may work for average people at their kitchen tables and so forth. But when you start dealing with politicians who are in 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 the pockets of special interests, who have to appease their voters and maybe a polarized base of activists or what have you, you're dealing with people who have so many puppet strings tied to them that you know, their willingness to sort of enter into a conversation in good faith doesn't even matter. And if it if they were willing to do that, how could you really trust 
what they what they said that they were there to do. And this is particularly relevant for us at Braver uh, Angels right now, Stephen, because at the time that this podcast will be rolling out for folks to listen to, we will have launched our most ambitious effort yet to bring elected officials to the table to engage one another in a humanizing discourse at the state and local level all across the country with workshops rolling out in Congress too, I might add. Uh, it's called Braver Politics. And it's definitely something I'm going to look to pin you down on by the end of the conversation to see if we can get you out to one of our events. But you've already pioneered this sort of bridge building among elected officials, particularly among millennials. What has your experience been and why is that work, work worth it? It's definitely worth it. I think this is the, the fight for our democracy. And the experience I had, it really originates from taking a long view of our politics. The creative moment was really in 2011 to 2013. And I was looking at the trends around disillusionment, majority of Americans don't believe politics will solve the problems we face. That was disproportionately high for the millennials and, and youth demographics. Uh, we were looking at the tr rates, or the, the trends around voting and, and polarization, and we felt like this is an unsustainable track. And one of the best investments we could make is in preparing, training, and convening the next generation of leadership. And it was not only because we did see some positive attributes among young people who could be more open, more collaborative, looking at problems in a different way. But even more importantly, it was the fact that a lot of people often come to Congress, whether they're new or young, with a lot of ideas about changing institution, and they get co-opted by a lot of the forces that you are speaking of. And so it occurred to us that there really is that critical moment towards the beginning of their service where you can really define how they're going to lead longer term. And of course, the younger members, this is like building a pipeline of leadership. They've got a long runway ahead of them, whether they're in Congress or we also worked at the state legislative level, which is a major feeder system uh, to Congress. So what we noticed was this, that a lot of these younger, fresher, newer members to Congress, they want to do the right thing, but they quickly encounter uh, forces like money, for example, in order to stay relevant not only in office, but to have the right committee placements, to have some political clout, uh, you have to raise a lot of money. And the easiest way that, to raise that money is from special interest groups that might have business in front of your committees. Right. Another easy way to raise money is by being highly divisive and hateful against the other side. Because even if you want to be a collaborator, you realize that putting out hateful rhetoric is highly profitable and one way to bolster your campaign coffers. I've come into contact with a lot of members of Congress who think to themselves, well, doing the right thing is this path. Staying in office and being politically relevant is this path. And there's <laughs> often not a lot of uh, overlap there. So right. then you get to a deeper level to, 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 to get people onto the right path because it really, gets to what's your motivation for being in office? Are you there to be something or are you there to do something in the words of uh, one of my mentors? And if you're there to do something, you are willing to take those political risks. You are willing to serve a cause that's larger than yourself and do the right thing in terms of collaboration and being honest, um, as opposed to just self-preservation and getting co-opted by all these forces. And one thing we were able to help do there is not only help people stay true to their mission, but also find that reinforcement and peer level social group in terms of a caucus that we formed, the future caucus, that can help those young members down that path. And it really helps a lot. And, and it leads to things like us finding bipartisan agreement on a gun violence prevention legislation in the wake of Parkland that no one thought was possible. It led to bipartisan legislation on veterans employment that passed. In, in some, we were able to introduce over 200 bipartisan bills through Congress, 31 of which uh, were passed and signed into law. And so there's some real results there. And it shows, I think, for people who 
want to make a difference in Congress, that this is the way to get some things done. This is the exciting way, the way that I think is most fulfilling for people. And then you look at the others who've lost their soul and are just on this hamster wheel running and they say, that doesn't seem very appealing. Let me hang out with the cool kids and get some things done. Right. Well, it sounds like based on your experience, in part at least, based on your experience working with millennial elected officials in the Millennial Action Project, you've got a bit more confidence in the millennial generation than some folks do. You know, we get a bad rap sometimes from some some people, uh, millennials. And, you know, one thing that's true, uh, I guess, about, you know, being and how old are you, by the way, Stephen? I, I meant, meant to ask you that. Yes, I'm 32. You're 32. Okay, I'm 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 35. I'm a little, little bit more of an elder millennial or whatnot. Oh, well, not, not not quite. I think millennials go up to what? I think we've got 40 year old millennials right. now. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's that's remarkable. I keep telling people like at a certain point, you guys millennials are, are going to be middle aged. I guess we're going to be middle aged now. You know, yeah. um, Gen Z is is on the rise. But even for millennials, I think that many of us do not have clear memories of a time when American politics was not radic- was not very polarized. I mean, maybe it wasn't as radically polarized in the 90s as it is now. Clinton and Gingrich could come together on bipartisan legislation that at the time had the consensus of most of the country behind it. But even then, I remember being a kid in the 90s and hearing people talk all the time in the context of the Monica Lewinsky scandal. You know, Bill Clinton was impeached by, by the Republican con- or the Republican con- Congress uh, you know, impeached him, fought hard to remove him from from office. Many people at that time considered that a nadir, you know, in terms of a low point in 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 comedy and civility in in American political discourse and in our culture of of government. Fast forward a few decades now, those are definitely the good old days, <laughs> you know, to be to be sure, relatively speaking. But we are in this moment where the depolarization movement, I think, is it is is beginning to coalesce. I mean, I think you and I are in a position to sort of to sort of sort of feel it. Um, and yet, you know, Brave Angels, Millennial Action Project. All of the amazing organizations in in New Pluralists, and National Conversations Project, but also just folks on the ground doing civil society work, having to do with poverty, having to do with education, rebuilding communities that may not even think of themselves in a political context, but who are depolarizing their own their own local communities. All these things are happening. Yet at the same time, I think that many folks in the depolarization space wonder how can we get this sort of culture of coming together in a spirit of goodwill behind the sort of future that we believe in to really become popularized out in the sort of general marketplace, particularly among young people, particularly among millennials and and, and Gen Z. Now, you've been working with the younger cohort within this larger movement space, and you were featured in one of the most ambitious um, cinematic projects related to shining a light on the depolarization movement, uh, the reunited states. I'd be curious to hear any reflections you have on that project because you were a featured uh, a featured star of that of that documentary, and also love to hear from you what you think we should be thinking about in terms of extending the spirit of the movement to the younger generations. Mm-hmm. Well, the question you're asking is really the top question that's been on my mind for the last two to three years. You're right that the depolarization movement is coalescing, not only at a national level with the organizations you mentioned, but also how people feel on the ground at the grassroots level. Uh, We host Millennial Action Project hosted a series called Red and Blue Dialogues across Wisconsin, where we found an intense appetite for uh, depolarizing conversations. Uh, not just people who exist in the so-called moderate middle, but people who are all over the political spectrum. And so to me, the question I've been asking is how do we reach the tipping point, the Malcolm Gladwell tipping point for this movement? How do we connect the political options that are being made available to us with the demand that's coming from the people? There's a term out there that I talk about on the campaign trail the exhausted majority, which is the vast majority of Wisconsinites and Americans uh, who are sick and tired of the fighting. They want their legislators to be honest, inclusive, and work together, uh, but they also feel disillusioned by everything that they're seeing. 
And so how do we mainstream this idea? How do we move from, you know, where Dr. King was, say, in the late 1950s and get to the point where he was in, in say, 1964, 1965? And that was one of the reasons I first started thinking about the U.S. Senate race, which I know we'll talk more about. But it also led to the reunited states documentary and ben the director of the film had reached out and you know i was i was it was perfectly timed because i was thinking about how do we get some of these ideas that have been percolating up and it's just beneath the media radar in front of millions of people so they can see that there's a different way possible a different way forward and the documentary was a fantastic experience i think that You know, one, it captured the personal and the emotional journey of being on the front lines of bridging political and racial divides, uh, which really is worth, it's a story worth telling because as you know, if you're in this movement, you are cutting against the grain. Mm -hmm. You are fighting up against a multi-billion dollar business model that's telling people to do the exact opposite. And so there are these personal moments that you sometimes wonder, is there an audience? Do people care about this? It can be taxing on you mentally and psychologically. And so to capture some of those moments, I think are helpful because I think it shares with the wider public that, hey, you're not alone. There are other people who are on this journey with you doing different types of things. And the thing I was really excited about from the millennial action project story that they shared was that this is real and it's happening and when the establishment mainstream media doesn't cover these stories they don't cover when you know some of the bills i was mentioning earlier got close to zero media attention and trust me not due to lack of trying Mm -hmm. you know for the general public who's sitting at home and can tune on uh, tune into amazon prime or pbs and see oh republican elected official, democratic elected official, being cordial and respectful to each other, able to work on legislation together, see the dignity and humanity in each other. That's real, that happens. (laughs) Yes, it happens all the time. And I think this documentary film tapped into a medium that is really, I think, fertile ground for our type of ideas because streaming platforms are on a different business model than cable news and a lot of other forms of media. It's a different business model than social media. So it's just a great way to get our ideas out there. It was great that Van Jones, Megan McCain were able to jump on board and really just shine a spotlight on on this movement. There are a lot of people who I meet on the campaign trail um, who said, hey, I heard about you through, uh, you know, I heard about this documentary film. And so it did really kind of reach a, um, I don't know if, it, it reached a threshold of visibility that typically doesn't happen in our space. And I thought that was really important. Yeah. Well, no, I think so too. And Ben Recky, the director of that film, of course, is an incredible individual. Um, and anybody who sticks around through the credits will see about 30 seconds of John Wood Jr. in this studio. Yeah, <laughs> <That's smart. laughs> yeah right. Exactly. Just consider it like a Marvel movie. You know, you've seen the Stephen Olakara adventure saga, you know, fighting the demons of polarization and whatnot. And then you get that little teaser at the, at the end. So if there's a sequel, you know, maybe you'll see, maybe you'll see a bit more of me. That's but right. um, the, um, it's it's at the end of the day though it does seem clear that in order for the larger shift of consciousness that we are advocating for to really bear fruit in the political system um we need a new culture of governance to take root in america and that it seems to me is why you are on the campaign trail. It seems to me to be why you're pursuing uh, this this seat. And so I want to know about your experience as a political candidate, and for you to say more about why you're running and how your message is received. Because there be many people who say that okay. You know, you guys, idealism is, uh, you know, beautiful. Obviously, we want people to come together across party lines and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, politics is rough and tumble and vitriolic and even dirty. And it's hard for people to see how that sort of political brand can make it out in the mainstream political uh, arena. And so for myself, 
we were talking before we got on the line. I ran for Congress back in 2014. I ran for the, you know, uh, for the House of Representatives, 43rd District of California. I was 27 years old on Election Day. And I was saying the same things then that I say now, basically, you know. Um, and what I discovered at that time was that when it came to campaigning in front of ordinary Americans, and, you know, the district I live in is is very... Uh, very diverse, largely black and Latino, but with strong pockets of, of middle class, white and Asian voters across the board, though, people wanted to believe in the sort of picture of an American politics that resembles more closely the beloved community and the promise of e pluribus basunum um, than what was being reflected in the mainstream discourse. Everybody wanted that. Everybody wanted that at the end of the day, even if we struggled to see how it could be possible. But what the media wanted to pick up on and focus on, you know, I, I didn't go, I, I ran against Maxine Waters in that election cycle. I didn't go on TV bashing Maxine Waters at every turn. I made my case against her and so forth, but that's not how I raised money. In fact, I barely raised any money in my race. I had to do over again. That's one thing I changed. Um, but, you know, people on the ground responded to it, but the media didn't pick up on that message very much. And the institutional parties themselves, of course, had a difficult time accepting that as a genuine reflection of their priorities. So it's sort of like, OK, John, you're running as a Republican. We'll support you because you seem like, you know, a comparatively good candidate. But at the end of the day, we're not going to change our business model to try and create more bipartisan goodwill, you know, out of the landscape. Has anything changed from from when I ran in 2014 to when Stephen is running in 2022? Because for most of us, it looks like things have only gotten worse. And we're so spiritually connected. <laughs> 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 the way you reflect on the journey is exactly how I think about it. What you confronted is exactly what I confront. And why you did it is, is in many ways why I'm doing this. And it's it's amazing, man. It's it's really a pleasure to be in your presence. <laughs> well, the, feel, the feeling is the feeling is is mutual. And look, I'm not trying to be a downer. I'm very hopeful, uh, yeah. very optimistic that at the end of the day, um, not just you know you and I, uh, in, you know, in politics and out, but this movement will yeah. succeed. But I want to know what things look yeah. like on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. So you spoke about the business model, and when we launched our campaign, we launched it with a dignity tour across Wisconsin because. Yeah. We felt like listening with people where they are, understanding that the people closest to the issues are the true experts, not uh, you know, not not some kind of lobbyist in Washington D.C. If you're a farmer, you're probably an expert on dairy pricing here in, in, in Wisconsin. We want to hear from you on what's going on with that issue, and we felt like centering a politics of dignity over hate and changing the business model of incentives around that would be a fresh message uh, to people and would really resonate with perhaps what's already in their hearts and what they're seeking, but not finding in the media or in mainstream politics. And it was one of the most beautiful things uh, I've seen. We've now done over a hundred events across Wisconsin and we're campaigning in a way that challenges the business model itself, challenges what political consultants would tell you to do. We're in fact doing the exact opposite. The consultant would tell you, put out the most divisive message that fires up your base and only go to the most likely so-called primary voters mm -hmm. uh, who are the most hyper-partisans. And we're doing the exact opposite. First of all, we know, I've studied a lot of David versus Goliath, and I know that if we're going to win this race, it's going to be because we rewrote the terms of engagement and we played our type of game. And so what that means is we're explicitly reaching out to Democrats, Republicans, and independents mm. were explicitly putting out an inclusive message that speaks to the beloved community. And part of the reason why I decided to run this race is because this is a unique moment where doing what's right is also, I believe, what wins. Mm. And sometimes those two things don't over, always overlap. But in this case, they do because um, in order to win this race, you have to expand the electorate beyond your party coalition. And on top of that, I'm running as a Democrat um, and the Democrats are, are entering into a space this year, midterm election, Democrats have control of the White House and both chambers of Congress. You have to attract 
those politically homeless voters into your camp. And then on top of that, since Ron Johnson has taken a more extreme tack recently, there are a lot of disaffected Republicans right now who are wondering, where do I go? And what's in my heart is building those bridges. And it just so happens, I believe that's what wins this year too. So that to me is, is exciting. Now, the institutional forces we're coming up against are exactly the ones that, that you outlined. And when you look at what I call the political industrial complex, it's the relationship between not only political consultants and lobbyists and elected officials, but also candidates and money and media. Because most of the political establishment and the legacy media look at one data point to inform their reporting of elections and their view on elections, and that is money. And so there are two ways you can get into that financial across uh, the financial threshold. You could either um, you can either be a hyper divisive and partisan politician or candidate, and you can raise money that way, or you could be part of the financial elite. And, and in our case, we have someone who's uh, a son of a hedge fund billionaire from New York who moved to Milwaukee a few years ago and is running in this race. And so you can have the self-funder, financial elite, or you can be hyper-partisan. And sometimes you're both of those things. And the problem is, if you're running an underdog campaign that wants to change the business model of politics, you're running up against all of these institutional forces and the media um, decides whether or not to cover you. I'll say we're actually punching above our weight. Like we're consistently out of 12 candidates in the top three, even the top two. Uh, in the prediction markets for this race. Mm -hmm. um, media, some media outlets do decide to cover us. Some of them are a little bit more spotty. Others are just in their own estimation, their own words, hyper cynical about politics and they are skeptical when something new emerges. And so we're fighting up against that. But what keeps me going and what keeps me hopeful is the events that we do with ordinary people across Wisconsin who are really looking for this. So again, I think that there is a misalignment in the political industry. There is a demand and that supply is, uh, the demand and supply is not matching up here. But I do think when I talk to Wisconsinites about why our political system is broken, that the enemy is not our neighbors, the enemy is the system. And here are the constructive reforms to get things done. It's, it, it's quite compelling and it lands well. And it gets people to believe like, oh, Oh, this issue I care about, why isn't it moving? Oh, there's a whole system. There's a whole reason why it's not moving. And they don't hear those answers typically from traditional politicians. And, and we're, we're speaking that truth. Um, and it's creating an exhausted majority, a motley crew kind of coalition here uh, that I think is going to transform American politics. Now, you're running in a Democratic primary. Is that correct? That's right. Now, that's interesting, because I think I heard you say that you're reaching out to Republicans and independents, even in the context of running in a Democratic primary. Now, I did the same thing, although, yeah, I mean, and if you looked at my um, my campaign team, it was about evenly bipartisan. It was it was black, white and Latino. Um, you know, it was incredibly, incredibly diverse. But I was running in an open primary in the state of California, which, you know, people have a lot of different uh, opinions about how we should run our elections. And I actually do want to talk to you about some of that. We can find a few minutes here. Um, but I, I appreciated the open primary system for me because I wanted to run a campaign that was reaching out to everybody from the very beginning, as opposed to just having to swing around to everybody else in the final couple months of the of the campaign, you know, Um so I, I really, to me, it seems like a signal of your integrity that you're choosing to do that and do that early. Uh, but as a Democrat, um, what allows you to be able to find some common ground with with Republicans? I mean, you mentioned the fact that, you know, there are Republicans who feel disaffected and politically homeless. There are plenty of Democrats who feel that feel that way, too, of course. But there's got to be people on the right who see any Democrat come down the street and are a little bit, you know, a little bit suspicious, a little bit skeptical. How is the interactions between yourself as a candidate and conservatives and Republicans in the state of Wisconsin? What has that interaction relationship been like and how has it evolved or how is it evolving? 
You know, it's been it's been pretty encouraging so far. I'll give an example. We uh, in in one day. This is one of my favorite days on the campaign trail. Uh, we were in Madison, which is a very blue, liberal, progressive area, and we had an event with some of the longtime progressive leaders there, and we lit up the room, and, and it was great. Then we went north to a small town in uh, central Wisconsin called Nielsville. Nielsville is a very red area. Uh, veteran population, they have a well-known uh, veterans memorial that I was uh, speaking at. And as we're approaching this uh, event, I quickly realized uh, there are no Democrats in this uh, audience. <laughs> it's a group of people who are Republicans, but probably even more so, they struck me as anti-partisan and anti-political and, you know, screw the people in Washington kind of mentality. And so I get up there, give a speech about veterans, but also this deeper issue of trust in our democracy and how we can rebuild that trust. And all of a sudden, my campaign manager and I are looking at each other like, what just happened here? Because that room lit up just as much as the room in Madison did. Mm -hmm. And so I asked a few people afterwards, what just happened here? Right. And one woman came up and she said, you know, Steve, uh, we've learned not to trust any politicians, but I feel like I can trust you because you're speaking from your heart. And that to me meant a lot because there's something that goes deeper than ideology. You know, her and I could run through a bunch of issues and, and we'd probably agree on some and we'd disagree on others. But she was trusting my integrity and my character to be an honest leader and someone who honestly cares about her. And that in the US Senate, I would be representing not just Democrats, I'd be representing the entire state. And I think the way that we showed up to this event was not one in which we were writing them off. I mean, we were there, but also not one in which we were one in which we were looking down and being condescending, which I do see a lot uh, among some establishment elite Democrats these days. Mm -hmm. It was with a lot of humility and, and dignity and seeking to validate their life experience. You know, one of the undeniable truths that people have is their life experience. And we wanted to hear that. And I think it was so uncommon for them to have, hear from a candidate you know, talking and showing up in this kind of way. And for them, they probably, did. I don't know if they even knew that I was a Democrat. Uh, some of them probably did, but we were connecting on a deep, more, deeper, more human level. And so we've just been taking that model across Wisconsin. And I think the biggest area of common ground that we found is around how we create a more honest politics. I would say the issue of getting big money out of politics in terms of rooting out the corruption and getting legislators to work for us is probably one of the biggest applause lines I have. Uh, and when I talk about it in a way that is very common sense, like for example, members of Congress today often spend a majority of their time fundraising for their reelection, not doing their taxpayer funded job. And so we'll talk about this. I, I often share a story of getting coffee with a member of Congress at one o'clock in the afternoon. And afterwards she doesn't go back to her office. She goes across the street to our party headquarters to raise money. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you agree on the fact that our members of Congress should be doing their job and they're not right now. And it's the equivalent, it doesn't pass the common sense test for any uh, Wisconsinite who says, I can't go to my boss and tell them, can you continue paying me to do this job while I work a different job? It doesn't <laughs> pass <laughs> the test. And so those types of issues, there's a lot of common ground. And even on other issues, whether it's the environment or, you know, job training, tr job training in the future of work, we're finding a lot of common ground. And I think part of the superpowers I've been able to bring to this race is not only an interest in empathizing with other people's views, but really the last 10 years, as you know, I've been spending that time in spaces with Democrats, Republicans, and independents. So my rise in politics didn't come through the traditional party infrastructure. And so I wasn't only hanging with people who agree with me and are of the same party. I've been hanging with all kinds of people. And so I've understood the language to be able to speak across these divides. 
in a way that probably traditional candidates uh, haven't been able to. Even those who say maybe I want to be bipartisan, they haven't done the work of learning how to do that, which is a skill. It's a muscle that needs to be built over time. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. And, and the most exciting part on this trail is when we have those cross political groups coming together. Hmm. It's a little bit sad to think that some folks might imagine that the son of Indian immigrants would not receive a fair hearing in conservative, rural, you know, sort of white America. Uh, but it sounds like it sounds like you bring a spirit to the campaign trail that allows you to connect. Were you, did you have a familiarity with these communities? You said that you hung out with everybody. Did you have a familiarity with these rural and small town communities uh, before b- before hitting the campaign trail? I did. In the case of Nielsville, I, I had not been to that particular uh, Veterans Memorial yet, so that was my first time there. But I had through other experiences through music, as well as through MAP, uh, as well as my own work here in Wisconsin. I've been to a lot of rural communities, spent time on farms. One of my best friends, mm. you know, worked on a farm in, in the Driftless region of Wisconsin, which is southwestern part of the state, the highest concentration of Obama, Trump voters. And so I really have spent time there and, and doing the dignity tour was helpful too. And when I'm able to reflect back those kind of observations in a way that's genuine, uh, it shows people that I've, I'm, I'm not totally fresh to this, that I, uh, I, 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 I've, the experience I've done the homework and I've had the, um, the, the, uh, the, the real, kind of conversations uh, with people, uh, whether they're Democrat or not, um, in rural Wisconsin. So I'm able to speak to about the issues around substance abuse and around mental health and around affordable broadband access. And there's a big issue right now around the consolidation of, of bigger agro businesses and the small family farmer has alarmingly high rates of bankruptcy and, and even suicide. And so when we're able to reflect these issues, but also give a path to what we can do about it, um, I think it, it creates a real sense of, of hope. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think, you know, partly ha- going to the dairy breakfast, which is one of my favorite things to do in Wisconsin, you know, <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like a fun time. <laughs> it's a good time. You know, you're serving up some eggs on some styrofoam plates and, you know, hanging out with farmers. And, you know, I think a lot of politicians, they try and shoehorn every conversation, everything into a certain partisan narrative. And when you're free of that, you have a lot better conversations with people. And I'm not trying to shoehorn anything into any narrative. I'm coming in with a complete, you know, open mind. And that's what allows me to have these genuine conversations with, um, whether it's rural manufacturers, rural farmers or others, uh, and then be able to reflect that back in my conversations. Yeah, your your uh, your story and experience reminds me a lot of Barack Obama's experience as a candidate for United States Senator in Illinois, of course, um, where he, you know, I, I think a lot of the consultants and strategists said, that, "Look, your name is Barack Hussein Obama. You know, you're not only are you a black guy, but you got a Muslim name, an immigrant father, and so on and so forth. You know, don't waste your time in some some of these areas when you could probably carry the state by turning out, you know, turning out the." the urban cosmopolitan voters, but Obama spent a lot of time getting to know folks in the rural parts uh, of Illinois, you know, farmers, ranchers, and kind of, you know, basically just more sort of, more sort of country folks and found himself well received. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, you would never know it looking back at his tenure as, as president and, you know, problem about actually being in office. And I wonder if you worry about this a little bit, should you win the idea that you suddenly can't connect with people in a, in a direct sort of way as much anymore, but in the state of Illinois, I mean, you know, certainly during the time that he was campaigning and then serving as United States Senator Obama, despite having a vastly different background, was able to build real bridges, it seems, uh, with the rural and conservative constituents that he, that he represented. Um, but I want to ask you about a certain area of policy that bears upon the polarization question rather rather directly. And to bring in another uh, somewhat unique political candidate uh, into the conversation, you know, we've had uh, Andrew Yang on this uh, podcast and, you know, I've been on uh, Yang's show subsequent to that and got to know him uh, a bit. And so he's got this initiative that I, this this new effort, which I'm sure you're familiar with, called the Forward Party, where they are advocating for changes in our electoral system 
you and I talked a little bit about the open primary um, uh, concept. And of course, that's something that is active in various places. But Yang is also out there stumping for rank choice voting. And, and broadly speaking, he thinks that a multi-party democracy would be de depolarizing in a way that, you know, a, a, a two-party system uh, simply is not. Are you paying attention to reforms in this area, reforms to the electoral system itself? Um, and if so, where do you come down on some of these issues as a matter of policy and how they may or may not uh, be a part of the larger sort of set of solutions to the hyperpolarization issue? Absolutely. And we've premised our campaign on changing the business model of politics, and we're releasing an agenda on that. And each of the proposals are ones that I've previously gotten bipartisan support around. And as part of that, I'm proud to be the first ever candidate for the Senate in Wisconsin who's embracing open, nonpartisan primaries and ranked choice voting. Here in Wisconsin, we're calling it final five voting, uh, similar to the final four system that is in Alaska right now. I fully support it. I do believe that's one of the most impactful reforms that can help to open up and free up our politics. Mm. And it's striking, actually, that that I'm the first to do it. Uh, to me, it's, it's pretty common sense. But uh, here in Wisconsin, I helped to convene the bipartisan coalition that has the final five voting bill in the state legislature right now. And it's making its way through. There's a bit of a grassroots uh, movement behind the bill as well. And I think that's really important. Some of the other key points of the change the business model agenda also speaks to money and how we can empower a more diverse array of people uh, in order to run for office. For example, it's an issue that I've, I haven't heard any candidate talk about, but again, I'm coming at this uh, from the outside, <laughs> is allowing uh, candidates to be on their campaign payroll for up to a year. Uh, there are not a lot of working class people who can neglect their job and their income for over a year to run for a federal office. Mm. And, um, and that I think is, is, is really important to help to break the stranglehold of what's currently a club of millionaires, uh, say controlled by billionaires uh, in Congress. Uh, I was I, at, at various times I was working three part-time jobs. <laughs> when I was, you know, 26, 27 years old running, yeah. running for Congress. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's, it, it really is, is um, a struggle and sometimes just not accessible for working class people. Uh, we are talking about fair maps and, and gerrymandering reform, having a nonpartisan process of uh, redrawing districts. Uh, I am also the first candidate in this race to support term limits as part of that change the business model agenda, because uh, right now, members of Congress see their goal in Congress as self-preservation versus it having a set period of time to go in and make a difference. And I believe in the founder's vision of a citizen legislature where you go in and make the laws and then you leave office as a private citizen to live under those laws. So those are some of the themes, but I think one of the challenges we have in the reform space is bringing these ideas to a critical level of awareness and understanding. So there, we have reached that level around money in politics and gerrymandering reform. We're not yet there on open primaries and ranked choice voting. And that's one contribution I hope our campaign can make is a very emotional grassroots appeal to introducing healthy competition in elections and allowing really opening up the party uh, duopoly in our electoral system. I believe that's what voters want. Um, but again, it's not part of the political consciousness yet um, in our country. And uh, we need, I think, not only myself, but other people trying to uh, elevate those issues uh, in the context of a campaign. Mm, absolutely. Well, look, it's fantastic to hear you weigh in on these issues and to hear your story, your testimony from what you're experiencing on the campaign trail and the hopefulness that shines through in it when you talk about these connections that you're making across these various different divides in the electorate, uh, in the context of this larger movement that you yourself have been such an important leader in. And so, Stephen, it's an honor to have you here. Um, I want to uh, 
uh, take our last few minutes to to um, to drill into this this uh, to, to to play this note, um, a note of remembrance, if you will, um, and perhaps recollection of the significance of the legacy of the nonviolent philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr. And to talk a little bit about how it is that should inform our work in the present moment, our understanding of democracy, and perhaps the larger spirit of the depolarization movement. You know, I, I frequently remind people that Dr. King said that we seek not to defeat or humiliate the opponent, but to win his friendship and understanding so that we may be reconciled to one another in the beloved community. But Dr. King was fighting a fierce moral battle that obviously was seeking concrete political change in American society. It's a different context, different time than the one you and I are in now, and I don't want to pretend that all things are, are, are equal, but what's also true about King is that he thought that that material effort was for naught if it was not ultimately rested upon and pursued by means of a deeper spiritual transformation in the heart of Americans and in the heart of the self. How does the philosophy of Kingian nonviolence inspire you? How does it inform the work that you do? And how important is it that we remember the true philosophical legacy uh, of Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, it starts with how I show up every day. And I've taken a lot of time of meditation and spiritual practice to, to get to this point where Every day, especially in politics, there are all sorts of forces that want to take you off track and having a really strong center, a uh, center of gravity around your mission and what your calling is, is, is really important. And King has continued to be a North Star, as you reference, around the goal of reconciliation and remembering that even your political enemies are not your true enemies. Right. The concept of radical love is not only, I think, a political necessity for a diverse democracy, it also speaks to what is required of us in our hearts in terms of, of how we show up. So I did a lot of that internal work before running for office because I know if you haven't done that work, you're going to lose yourself real quick. <laughs> and certainly when you're in office and you, you're kind of alluding to this earlier, are you worried about what happens once you're in Congress? I mean, you're going to lose your, you lose your soul like that if you haven't done that um, internal work. And um, the second way that it inspires me is how King built diverse coalitions for his agenda. That has been a North Star to me as well, because in order to create a consciousness shift and a legislative shift, you cannot only talk to your tribe. And King, I think very smartly raised not only black consciousness, but white consciousness around an agenda for, for civil rights. And, and the nonviolence philosophy was what was the foundation for that. Um, and then the final thing is, is um, you know, it's interesting because um, today it's, it's true that we're not seeing, um, you know, we do see political violence in the case of things like uh, January 6th, um, but the kind of political violence and, and real violence that King was facing was, was different than, than what, what, what we face today. But I do think bringing up the topic of nonviolence is important because of the values that are uh, undergirded within that philosophy. It's like, why do we want to love? It's not only because that's the most effective way to make change. I also think that loving is the most effective way to find ourselves and find a sense of spiritual renewal and ultimately you know to get real deep here it's like why are we on this planet why are we living these lives mm -hmm. um are we here to you know discriminate and push down and um, hate certain people or are we here to love and elevate and, and lift up mm -hmm. and you know when your time is up on this planet um you can look back and ask yourself which path did i did i choose 
So obviously I'm running this race because I believe that there are some concrete legislative changes that, that we can make. But I also think that there is a deeper spiritual um, dimension to this that I'm trying to surface, you know, to, to put in really plain terms, you know, here in the Midwest, we talk about Midwest nice. In Wisconsin, <laughs> if anyone's traveled to the state, you've been here for maybe a wedding or came here to enjoy the natural beauty. Right. To a person, every person comes away saying, God, the people in Wisconsin are so nice. They're so kind, they're so generous. And then at the same time, Wisconsin politics is known for being the center of polarized trench warfare, winner take all, zero sum politics. <laughs> How do those two things coexist? Well, I think that this Kingian philosophy, you know, whether we name it or not on the campaign trail, is about surfacing the kindness that's already deep within us. That's beautifully put. Beautifully put. Well, Stephen Olakara, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you for being a friend of Braver Angels and of the movement to depolarize America. And so, folks, if you are interested in being a part of this movement, if you are interested in the work of, as we say at Braver Angels, building a house united, then get involved. You can join us as a member at BraverAngels.org. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. And we'll have more information about Stephen Olakara in the links to this video below. Thank you very much, folks. Once again, we are building a house united. And we will see you soon.